an update from the NTSB into the investigation of the contact of the container ship Dally with the Francis Scott Key Bridge and the subsequent bridge collapse. It raises the question, could certain parts in the electrical subsystem have failed and caused the blackout that led to the Dolly ship colliding with the key bridge in Baltimore and causing this ultimate bridge collapse. So a couple of days ago here on June 24th, the NTSB gave us an update. This is now the second update on their investigation so far. And I wanna just kind of zoom into this little section right here. So the investigators have completed in-person interviews of the vessel's crew. Onboard examination of engineering systems and testing of electrical systems has been completed. And the documentation of the damage to the vessel structure is ongoing. But here's the part I wanted to really focus on right in here. It says, during the accident voyage, electrical breakers HR1 and LR1 unexpectedly opened when the vessel was three ship lengths away from the bridge, causing the first blackout, which was the loss of electrical power, to all of the shipboard lighting and equipment. Now, if you remember on the video I did for you a month ago on the NTSB's preliminary report, that's the first report, that's this right here, this is what they were referring to. They said LR1 here and HR1 here had inadvertently opened. They don't know why. And so this, these are the breakers here that protect the transformer one right along here. So as you can see up here, this affected both the 6600 volt bus and it also affected the 440 volt bus. So both the low voltage bus and the high voltage bus. So somewhere in here potentially lies the cause of why did these two guys open up. Right here, we want to really focus on the verbiage that the NTSB is using. So it says, while examining and testing the vessel's electrical power distribution system and control circuitry, NTSB investigators, in coordination with the vessel crew and parties to the investigation, noted an interruption in the control circuit for HR1's under voltage release. So let me take this here and highlight this for you, because this is very important here. They noted an interruption in the control circuit for HR1's under voltage release. So coming back here and looking at their simplified circuit diagram, it wasn't LR1. It was something in the circuitry surrounding HR1 that caused HR1 to trip. What they are saying is that this was a low voltage interrupt. So what can happen, uh, remember, when you're putting multiple diesel generators like these in synchronization. Now with these diesel generators running, remember something very tricky has to happen here in order for everything to be running correctly. There are three conditions that need to occur here in order to synchronize two of these diesel generators together. Because as you can see by their diagram, diesel generators numbers three and four, the outputs were tied together like this, just tied together. And diesel generators one and two were out of the circuit. They're open circuit at this point. So these three things must be true. Number one, the voltage must be the same. The voltage output of both of these generators must be the same and they must match the voltage of the bus. Number two, the phase angles have to be the exact same. So when you're looking at those sine wave outputs of the voltages of each of these generators, they can't be off. You can't have one here and then another one like this. They have to line up perfectly like with an oscilloscope. That's number two. And then number three, and then number three, the voltage output must be the same on both generators. Once those are all in alignment and they throw that switch that connects the two together, they then have to make sure they're both sharing and giving an equivalent output load so that one generator doesn't try to become the load of the other one. They're both supplying power. They're not drawing power. So somewhere in this mixture here, what it looks like they're saying is that they got this low voltage circuitry here. They have this circuitry here that's sitting here and protecting HR1. And there's probably one here also for LR1. And so it looks like the low voltage sensor on that has tripped. That was supposed to protect HR1. Now, many of you are probably new to this concept. How does low voltage, how could that possibly trip a breaker? Here's a, a breaker panel from a, a lady's condo that I know, and this caused a fire in her condo. So you can see where it, where there was some scorching there on the bottom. But typically, 
when you have a breaker that trips, like let's say one of these pots and goes in the middle there, what causes that? Well, it's usually a short circuit or maybe something's touching ground. And so a large current is now trying to flow and it surpasses the rating of the breaker. Like let's say it was a 20 amp breaker. And of course a short circuit is going to be an infinite type of a current and it's going to bam, trip that breaker in no time. Okay. So that is the type of a breaker trip that you're used to seeing. But how does low voltage cause a breaker trip? Well, remember, these circuits here have smarts around them. And don't, for, you know, don't forget that surrounding HR1 and LR1 and even HR2 over here and LR2 over here is circuitry to detect high voltage and most likely low voltage as well. So now the NTSB has to determine, okay, why was there a low voltage situation? Is one of the diesel generators going bad? Because what can cause it possibly is, you know, let's say it's not spinning up to speed. Something went wrong there. Even though it should try to remain in sync, but if it gets too far out of whack, bam, those breakers are going to trip on us. So in the NTSB update the other day, they give us this picture here of this terminal block. Now, let's read very carefully into what they're saying here. They're saying this is a terminal block identical to the model removed from the ship. So this is from WAGO. NTSB investigators subsequently removed an electrical component, a terminal block, see figure, from the control circuit for HR1's under voltage release. And it says here two portions of, um, here's another interesting one. It says here two portions of wiring associated with the terminal block were also removed. And we continue to examine the removed components at the NTSB Materials Laboratory. We will continue to evaluate the design and operation of the vessel's electrical power system. So look at this. They're evaluating the design and operation of the electrical power distribution system. And they're still investigating all aspects of the accident. So this beckons the question here. Does the NTSB think that there was something either wrong with the design or the operation. They haven't specified if there's something wrong with the part yet, but the fact that they pulled this one part from this one circuit out of all of the terminal blocks that they could have pulled off of that DIN 35 rail, that seems kind of strange to me. And you guys know me, I'm an electrical engineer by training. And so I of course took this part and ran to town with it. I went to Wago's website. They have like 50,000 parts and there was no way I was going to find it. So I had to use AI with an image search on there to find what this part was based on the picture that the NTSB gave us here from their preliminary um, report the other day. So the way these terminal blocks work here, as you can see, you push in the wire and look what happens to that wire clamp there. See the cage clamp? It pushes in, so now it's making contact with it. And so that's how you make the contact between the two leads so that you can connect wires that you plug in on this side of the terminal block with wires that will plug into the other side of it. That's what that strip of metal does on the middle of it as you're looking through here and you can see it connects the two together. It's kind of like a little miniature bus bar. And then here you can see how these blocks can all line up on the DIN 35 rail. So this is what the copper DIN 35 rails look like. So they go like this, and then they can take all of these different individual terminal blocks there and just plug them on there. They snap right on, and then they can use a tool to unsnap them right back off. And so this is similar to the bus that they probably had on the dolly ship. You can see I found this part here on Wago's website, and this exactly matches the image that the NTSB just gave us on their report. So we know that this is the part that they pulled off of there. And this is called a three conductor through terminal block. And remember the NTSB is very infamous for opening up a whole Pandora of questions. They give you a couple of snippets of, you know, some nuggets of info as they're doing their testing and stuff like that and their investigations. And sometimes it just raises even more questions because we don't have the whole diagram. I would like to see the whole diagram of where this terminal block fits in so we can get a better idea for how this might be involved in, in the failure here because right now we don't know. Now there's one thing I can think of of what would cause this particular part to fail would either be a manufacturer defect or check this out so when I come back here to the data sheet or this terminal block and I look down here I'm going to show you something that's that I wonder if everybody stops to read when they go to use parts like this 
And and again, I don't know what kind of wiring was used there. If they were using aluminum wire, you can see right here, they need to use this LU plus contact paste for the termination. Okay, because you can see here what it does, it destroys any oxide film during clamping. Sometimes with these cage clamp connectors, you can get a little bit of a, a destruction of the, the film on there. And then it prevents oxidation at the clamping point also. It prevents electrolytic corrosion between aluminum and copper. That's always a big problem when you have dissimilar metals touching. So that's why they want you to use this particular contact paste. What happens if you fail to put on this contact paste? Is that a problem? So here, again, there's more unknowns that we don't know. But as an engineer, these are all of the things we have to look at and think about. I have to go through these data sheets word by word by word, every section of these data sheets to make sure that the part was being used correctly. That's a big problem in, in electrical. A lot of times you'll see users or you know even engineers using parts incorrectly because they forgot to read one part of the spec. And you know, one other thing to consider too is this spec here does not specify that these terminal blocks are vibration proof. Now, Wago does sell them and they're on this very website of theirs that, that advertise that they are vibration proof. So that could be another thing too. You know, I mean, you plug in these, these wires, how do you know they didn't like wiggle back out somehow? Remember, these large commercial ships go through some very treacherous water sometimes, and these things are bouncing up and down and up and down. So remember, this is just one facet of their investigation, but I just thought it was interesting that of all of the terminal blocks on there, they pulled this one out and none of the others. So they must think that there's something wrong with it, or maybe they just want to investigate it to see how or why it might have tripped. So anyway, stay tuned for more, because as we get more information from the STSB, we will let you know. So thanks for joining us tonight, folks, and we will see all of you on the next one.